Good morning, all. I'm going to call the School Board of St. Lucie County Special Work Session meeting to order and welcome everyone that is with us today. If you would, please stand and take the pledge with me. Thank you. You may be seated. And just as a reminder, we still are um, wearing our face masks, so please keep them on at all times while you're in the boardroom with us. There's an echo. We're going to uh, give us a second. We'll fix it. Okay. All good, thank you. Nope, still echoing. Oh, that's better. Okay, thanks. <laughs> nope, nope, still there. Come on, Vine, you're still working here now. You haven't retired yet. Got a couple days. Test. Test, test, no echo? Okay. Okay, we'll try again. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Um, and for the record, um, Ms. Richardson is joining us via Teams today. She's not able to be with us in person, but as you saw briefly, she is with us. So we do have all five board members in attendance for this workshop meeting. Ms. Richardson, I would just ask as we go along, since I can't see you to recognize you, if you have comments, if you would just let me know that um, and I can recognize you so there's not a lag in what you're saying and what we're hearing. We're hearing. Appreciate that. Okay, Mr. Superintendent, Superintendent, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got uh, four presentations today. We're going to start off, uh, we're very fortunate this morning uh, to have a a partnership with uh, the Sheriff's Department. We work very closely with them in the Police Athletic League PALS. And so I'm gonna ask the Lieutenant Jamie Wells to come on up and uh, he's gonna make a presentation to the board about this partnership. And, he, and uh, Lieutenant Wells, if you would introduce your team too. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gent. I'd like to introduce our uh, Public Information Marketing Director, Brandon Berry. He's uh, a very important part of this process. Sergeant Wes Harbin's one of our board members and our secretary for PAL is uh, Stephanie Herring. So first of all, thank you guys for giving us a few minutes here to share this uh, vision that we have. And you know, the great thing about it is anything we can do for kids, that's what we're all about. I'm a lieutenant with the school resource unit and Sergeant Harbin is also part of that. So anything we can do to give kids positive reinforcement and, you know, dealing directly with law enforcement, that's what we want to have. And uh, this is a, a goal of ours we set forth about a year ago, trying to get the process going so you're going to see a lot of work in a few slides. So, so our mission, obviously, in a nutshell, is to um, just, just let kids look at us in a different light. Look at law enforcement and say, hey, you know what, they're good guys and uh, break down any kind of barriers there might be. And, uh, you know, just leave a positive role model for kids so they can grow in the community. And that's basically what our vision is. The uh, proposal that we have today is to build a PAL center at Dan McCarty. There's a property there by the old tennis courts on 11th Street between that and the track. So that's the, uh, the process that we've been working on. Ms. Sullivan's been a big part of that as far as uh, you know, open up the, her arms for the campus to say, hey, this is gonna be a great, good site and a uh, great location for kids. So looking at the, uh, the vision there, the reason we picked Dan McCarty is because there's about seven local public schools. Kids can have access to the uh, facility. There's about 5,000 students between those seven schools. We do already have the transportation somewhat situated. We have three vans that are with, uh, with PAL. So we wanna make sure that we have some after school opportunities for the kids. And what we did is we put together this process and we have a uh, tier one or plan one is to uh, build a facility. 
and it's about 12,000 square foot roughly. There's going to be classrooms, there's going to be some wrestling, which is a big part of Powell right now, the boxing, and then obviously a basketball court. So we want something to give a kid's place to go where they can get involved, you know, to break down those barriers, you get them involved in sports, and then they'll open up with you. We want to work together with a lot of non-for-profits to bring any kind of uh, mental health counseling or anything we can do, anything to benefit a kid. We don't care. It doesn't necessarily have to be sports. But the vision is just to get them in those doors and really, uh, you know, love them and give them some inspiration in life. So that's what we're about. This is a, uh, the, the model that we, we came up with. It's, you know, the St. Lucie Sheriff's Pal, of course, and uh, with a great partnership, Mr. Jen says. So that's basically it. I didn't want to take up. I want to have time for you guys, if you have any questions for us about it, to really uh, answer those questions for you today. Located in a location now. I know at one time it was. Yes, um, ma'am. We're at we're in a temporary site right now in the Kmart Shopping Plaza at okay. Virginia and US One there behind Seacoast Bank. It's mm -hmm. the old Rena Center. So we have a uh, a lease there, and right now we're active there. You were where was the location? We uh, we used to be at the Outlet Mall for the last two years previously. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So currently you are not doing these activities at this time or are you we are doing the boxing right now and then we do have the wrestling that that's been going on but of course high school wrestling's been going on right now and it, the season just ended so um you know we've done some great things last year we sent them on a field trip to north carolina and i think they went to iowa as well mm -hmm. so we're really invested every penny that we raise or do anything for pal goes right back to the kids that's the biggest part of what what our goal is to put every piece of penny that we get any donation right into this this goal of getting this building built. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What capacity will you have at this building? We've got the possibility of some 5,000 plus students, but what capacity? I think the capacity is about 330, if I remember right, um, just based on the size of the building. It's 12,800 square foot, but it's about 330 at one time. That's great. So, and I noticed from the schools there will be varying times that they arrive during the yes, day. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, well, and like there's five schools within a mile distance, um, just a short drive to pick them up or what have you. So we're hoping that we're going to get a big resolve. And this is like this is like I said, this is the first preliminary stage, and then eventually we want to put about eight different classrooms in there so we can use it for resources for the school to use for different events they want to have. And like I said, not for profit partnerships is what we're looking for as well and year-round operation. Absolutely, yes, ma'am. Fabulous. Space, you're going to make that available? Absolutely, that was part of the uh, contract that we sat down with, with the school board, to say that we, if it's something beneficial to the community, we want to offer that up and be, you know, we got, there's a lot of good partnerships. Children's Home Society, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of different ones that we work with hand in hand that we'd like to, you know, extend to Olive Branch, so to speak. Mr. Kelly? Yes, sir. The, uh, the funding so far, we've raised about 300 plus thousand. And the cost is going to be about 900,000, and we have a, a long term lease contract that I'm sure at some point will be presented to you. So it's going to be a partnership between us, the sheriff's office, and also the school district. Okay, again, who's going to own the building, though? Who's going to give the lease? Who's going to own it? Well, the sheriff's office pal will be the, the, the contract owner of the building, but there's a long-term lease, 50-year lease is what it was dedicated for. So, I mean, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a trio between the sheriff's office as far as staffing and then also the agreement between the school district and us. Yes, sir. Okay. So we are, we are um, using our property to, to put the... Put this on and partner with them um, so there really won't be a financial impact to, to the school district per se i also wanted to recommend uh re recognize lisa sullivan the principal of dan mccarty as well um who's you know this is a program for the students to come in from you know particularly in that area uh that where the schools that were mentioned uh this is a weekend deal too is right as, as, yes, as sir. well as after school and evening is also you know the weekend so the students have something productive to do and it's been successful so we've got the we've got you know we've got um, the land there and we've got uh, um, space we've got plenty of space at Dan McCarty 
um, as well to to place the building there and then to work you know to work with the sheriff's department as we've done uh, in the past and then maybe even uh, you know we may even you know look around the county for expansion and other uh, municipal and other municipality as well um, after this gets started so I think this is the beginning of just a great uh, program that will really benefit our students our children and our community so it's so the, the school board owns the building yes, and the property? Yes, yeah, we own the property. And the lease goes to them, just like in they're the gonna, city of Port yeah, St. Lucie. They're going to put the building on there. The right. PAL building, uh, I think it's a 50-year lease, the same thing, and, and the city owns the property. Yes, and sir. That, that, I mean, I, I wish we could have even more because I tell you, that, that PAL deal, I've been in it when I was a kid, and all my grandsons went to it in Port St. Lucie, and it, it's a wonderful program. Absolutely. I wish we had a lot more buildings. We could, you know, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for all your... Well, yes, sir. Thank you. Jamie, just I want to thank you for uh, your vision and, and getting this program. We, we talked about this about a year and a half ago, and, and it's finally coming to fruition. It's good to see this. But, Jack, it's almost like the Boys and Girls Club on Garden City's property. You know, obviously the school district will own the property, but they'll build the building, and if anything happens, always reverts back to St. Lucie County. Right. But obviously it's not with the sheriff's support, and, and these are the partnerships that we want to make, particularly in areas where we want kids to be more active and off the streets. Um, the, the, we need these type of programs and we need these type of partnerships to make our uh, facilities more viable to the students in the community. Yeah. As I said, it's just like the city. Yeah. Yes, sure. with, exactly. their, with their, you know, clubs. So we'll be bringing back uh, a voting item to the board at uh, either the next or the following board meeting. Yeah. The back of material will be there to, to, to officially uh, uh, sign off on it. Well, you guys did this before my time, so I just ask it. <laughs> it's a great thing. And again, thanks. Thank you, sir. And we appreciate you sharing the renderings with us there, too, for good visuals. And I believe we have some representatives from the builder with us today. Thank you all for being here. Ms. Hawley, can you speak up or take a uh, little bit closer? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. All right. Would you like to recognize your builders? Yeah, um, we've been uh, a big thanks to Jacqueline Construction. They've been going through the process with us. They did all the engineering work and subbed it out to the different contractors to come down with a uh, a figure for us and they did a lot of work we've had a lot of meetings on the side to see if we can you know really use our money efficiently to make sure there's no waste to make sure we get the product that we want because like we said we want this thing to be something special and it is going to be something special i was showing mr jen earlier we have a uh, if i would real quick we got a legacy brick here what we want to do is we want to put it out to the uh, community members um, you know, I bought one of this from my parents who both passed away as a legacy brick. That's going to be part of the foyer. And we want to have an <laughs> alumni section. We want to have different sections where people can go sit there on a nice park bench and look down and, and talk about their loved one. It's going to be there for the next 100 years. So this is something you can go to our PAL website. And it's $100. And 80% uh, of it goes to the PAL for this building project. So Great. just showing that off real quick. Get my two minutes deal. <laughs> so. Any other questions for All right. others? I want to know how many graduations you're going to be at this year. Every one of them. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> We're good. Well, I'd just like to say thank you to Mr. Jett, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, Dan Frank's been a big part of this, and all the board members. We look forward to the partnership and, uh, you know, great things to come. So. I want to make sure all you're going to be available for the ribbon cutting. We don't know what the date yet, but it's coming. I'm here to tell you. I got two years to retire, and this is like my last two raw. So <laughs> we want to do something good for these kids. So we thank you guys for your continued support, and uh, God bless you. One more question. Oh, one more question. One more question. question. <laughs> one more question. Oh, Dr. I'm Mills? Sorry. When can we expect the building to be completed? Well, if you, if you haven't been building anything as of recent, um, you know, we're, this is going to really, once we finalize and everything hopefully goes through with the contract as far as, hey, this is signed off on and everybody approves it with the board, then we can really get our big fundraising push going. We're hoping that we can, you know, absorb some, maybe some of the CARES Act monies or what have you, get some, so we're going to be doing a big donation push to get, like I said, we've got a third of the money we've already raised prior to. So we're going to be on it hot and heavy. So I'm hoping within a year we can break ground. And then uh, it's just a matter of the, uh, the process of getting the materials and stuff. I know with the COVID, it's got things pushed back. So I wouldn't really want to put a timeline on it, but as quick as we can. That's the best way to answer that. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.
Okay, our next, um, our next topic is going to be the um, elementary and secondary school emergency uh, relief plan. And we'll get that up on the screen there. Helen, uh, Dr. Wild, go ahead to the, to the next slide. What I wanted to do here this morning was make sure that we shared with the board. Uh, this can be confusing, but I'm gonna, we're going to try to simplify this. There's three separate um, funding sources or pots of money, and you have that in your handout as well. Um, ESSER 1 was about $10.3 million. ESSER 2 will be around $40 million. And then ESSER 3, we'll know more about that this week. The legislature, I understand, reached an agreement last night on the budget and in the process. We haven't really received any of the, the information yet in the weeds as far as um, what our share will be of this. Uh, on the ESSER, um, the first ESSER uh, dollars that are there, uh, you can see that the district uh, was distributed uh, $10.3 million. And you can see what went to the charter schools and to the private schools and indirect costs. So it was really about $8.3. 90% of this has already been spent. Pretty much, uh, and it'll go through the, uh, it, um, I'm not going to make the presentation, but uh, you can see where that's gone. It's really for the PPE for this year in school, our laptop devices, working with our students with disabilities, devices for them. Um, the Nearpod, the Achieve, these are instructional, um, Achieve 3000 instructional programs, uh, lesson development, and then they'll also be, um, part of the 90% will be in the summer school, our summer school program, and then we'll be um, going in and touching the other pots. So what we wanted to do <coughs> this morning was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> give, you an <coughs> give you an overview of, uh, of where we are with this and, uh, and answer any questions that the board would have. We have Dr. Wild will be presenting, Bill Tomlinson will be presenting, and Terrence O'Leary will be presenting in the three areas. Um, within the presentation here in a couple of minutes, we'll talk about, you know, we're, we're limited. Um, the dollars can only be spent for certain projects, and um, so it's important that we stay within, within those guidelines, and there may be some minor tweaking of that once we hear from the state legislature this week um, to see what they've done as well um, uh, with it. And then um, I, would, I would anticipate within about, uh, if not by the end of this week, certainly within the next two weeks, we would have a really clear picture from the state legislature um, on what we can do, you know, uh, what we can do, and uh, how much money will be coming to the school district. And then within the presentation, we talk about that it's a two, three years um, mm -hmm. out where the money has to be spent. So, uh, Dr. Wild, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gent, uh, Madam Chair, Board Members. I'm very happy to be here. And I first want to recognize Roderick Nada, who is uh, our Director of Federal Programs in the back, who's been working really hard um, on these projects, as well as Michelle Thomas in our finance department, who we work very closely with on this, uh, this workload. Uh, with that said, Mr. Gent just reviewed CARES 1. It's commonly referred to as CARES 1. And that is the budget that we initially worked with. And now we're really going into detail on the second one, ESSER 2, commonly referred to. And our share of those dollars is 33 million nine hundred and eighty two thousand and change and all three of these acts um, are really about us committing to some long-term projects over the budget period um, so you'll see there's some overlap as we go along Mr. Jett mentioned the allowable expenses, and you can see here they are um, very specific to needs that have been created as a result of the pandemic. So addressing learning loss for us, of course, is one of our biggest priorities, which includes our summer school and after school activities, um, educational materials, software, um, technology, as well as mental health services and student services, and then the sanitizing and PPE, um, and some health plan. Uh, we are also permitted to use these dollars for indoor air quality projects as well. With instruction being our core business, uh, we want to first talk to you about uh, what we're using these monies for, uh, first and foremost, for our students, which as you already are aware, we have greatly expanded our summer school for this summer. And uh, we've done a presentation on that already. And we intend to sustain that for the next couple years um, to ensure that our students are all on track um, as we go through this time period. Um, in summer school, we're doing elementary remediation, secondary credit recovery, transition programs for kindergarten and ninth grade, as well as our extended school year. Um, we are also going to be committing to continuing our K through 12 tutoring. Um, and expanding it in the secondary grades as well. And as you already know, we did negotiate with our union partners and settled on a salary incentive package 
um, to incentivize our teachers for this expanded school year, um, summer school year, um, as well as supporting curriculum materials in the coming next few years. So related to the resources, um, we will be, as you know, transitioning to new standards and new textbooks. And so the, we will be using instructional materials dollars for the core, but we will be receiving all the supplementary resources for our teachers that really add great value to those new materials as part of this. We will also continue our Achieve 3000, which is a reading software for high school remediation. We will be getting the iReady toolboxes for reading and math. That is a resource that our teachers really appreciate in K through eight. Um, and it's been previously purchased at some schools, but we are going to get it for all schools. And then the ready books, which are the current standards for next year. Next year is our last year with those standards. So for that blended year, we'll be supplying those books for our teachers. Also, you heard Mr. Gent mention Nearpod. I know some of you have been involved in some of our professional development sessions that utilize Nearpod. It's a wonderful, engaging, interactive software program that also includes content for our teachers. Very popular, and we are extending that on, um, as well as our Canvas, which is our learning management system um, that we do all of our distance learning on, but we want to make everyone aware that this is also a tool that our teachers use in brick and mortar instruction. It's a place where we keep all of our resources and a place where kids can go to access their lessons if they are quarantined or homesick. In addition, we're going to do a classroom library refresh. It has been some time since we've been able to provide classroom books across all of our classrooms. So we will be doing that, making sure they're very culturally diverse books. There's wonderful titles and packages out there um, at this time. Also, on the school sites, the most important thing is making sure that we can provide services to the students in a very targeted way. So we will be giving one interventionist position to every single school. So currently, some schools have them out of their Title I dollars and some schools do not. So we will now make sure that everyone has either a reading or a math interventionist based on their data, their school improvement plan, and their current staffing. And we'll be providing additional interventionists with our, some targeted schools, some high need schools. Teachers Aids, this is an initiative that we piloted at some of our turnaround schools, St. Lucie Elementary, CA Moore, Lawnwood, very, very successfully, um, either well, Weatherby before they came out of turnaround. Um, the feedback from both the teachers and the administrators has been extremely positive. And this allows the teacher to get extra support in the classroom, especially during that small group instruction time for remediation or enrichment. And so we're going to be providing two per school, all schools, for the next two years we will get a teacher's aid. In addition, um, we are very focused on reducing the student to counselor ratio, and you know that from previous presentations. And we also were very fortunate to receive the SWELL grant a number of years ago. And that grant is for social wellness, it, the SWELL stands for Social Wellness and Emotional Learning Leaders. And it was a grant to recruit our own um, professionals to go into counseling um, with a focus on increasing minority representation in our counselor ranks. And this grant allows us to partner with FAU to make a locally um, specific counseling curriculum program and also to offset the cost of the tuition for our teachers. And that's been going very successfully. Our first cohort of um, counselors are ready for, for going into schools this year and they will be doing their internships. So we're going to offset the cost of that to allow them to focus on those inter internships and really sharpen their skills, which will also provide additional mental health um, support and counseling for our students. Um, in addition, we want to expand our district level support to the schools, especially in the area of math and reading. Um, with the new standards at this time of, uh, after COVID, uh, we really want to have enough people supporting our schools, as well as our health and mental health education pieces. And with these additional interventionists and coaches in the school, we want to make sure that we are coordinating and facilitating their training on an ongoing basis in a job-embedded way. So additional support to the schools. 
And then um, you're going to hear a presentation about our kindergarten roundup, which is our effort to go out and find our kindergarten students and make sure that they enroll in school early so they can take part in our transition program in summer school. You'll hear more about that. We're also going to enhance our VPK curriculum. Um, and it will be a curriculum that aligns into the uh, recommended text for ELA, for English Language Arts. And we are going to use these dollars to offset the cost of our afternoon VPK programs. As you know, we provide a full day. The funding only covers the first part of the day. And this will allow us to provide more Title I dollars to our schools to support their needs. And I will turn it over to Mr. Tomlinson at this time to cover the ESE and student services portion. Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Chen, we want to continue to enhance the work that is happening in the district by providing additional support for students with disabilities, but also looking at ways in which we can enhance the educational program and the well-being for all students within the district. Part of what we are continuing to do in looking at that health and wellness piece is to have the opportunity to expand the nursing services that we provide in schools. Currently, we work in a collaborative agreement with the Department of Health, and the Department of Health oversees the school clinics by delegating to the school health professional that works there, they work under their license. They only have a limited number of nurses that can provide that support, so for the next few years, this gives us an opportunity to really increase the number of nurses because we do have several children in our schools that are medically fragile, and this would definitely be a great support for them. We would also like to increase the opportunity to have school psychologist interns, because school psychologist is a critical shortage area, and we start every year and end every year with a shortage of these professionals. And if we can get the interns from the universities in and work and have them work alongside of our school psychologists, get the support and the supervision they need, this will enhance our employment pool and, and in the end really benefit the children that are in need of evaluations and moving forward to identify whether or not they may be a child suspected of having a disability but also having the opportunity to continue the work focusing on mental health support in schools. And then we would look to provide support in our tiered system of tier one, two, and three by having a multi-tiered system of support specialist that would have a focus on counseling and work to support those counselors within the school setting. During the summer school program, this summer school is going to look much different than any of the summer schools that we've had in the past. We're actively recruiting and bringing back children that have learning gaps that need support, but they may also have gaps that are, that are existing where counseling needs to be provided. So we would look at funding additional support by employees that are already working within the system, giving them an opportunity to work through that summer program. And then the ESE school-based specialists, the ESE program specialists at the district, working to have them support our schools in this process as well. And also giving additional days to our school psychologists to continue with the evaluation process to get as many kids evaluated that are already in the referral process before school actually begins and then specifically increasing the amount of assistive technology. You know with students with disabilities, it's all about access and giving them an opportunity to equally participate in the general education program. And some of them may need more visual representation through smart board technology. Those children with, that may be deaf or hard of hearing that need amplification and personal FM systems designated apps for communication on their iPads and more communication devices for those kids that need it. And also looking to replace some of the screen equipment that is currently in schools where we do vision and hearing assessments for children. And I'll turn it over to Mr. O'Leary. Good morning, Madam Chair, board members, Superintendent Gent. 
With our uh, monies, uh, that will uh, be utilized in several departments, and the first one is going to be with our facilities department. We'll be replacing uh, our, some HVAC systems. We'll be uh, providing a solution called bipolar ionization, which I'll discuss in a minute, and also from a f facilities perspective, also carpet replacement. So the first one, A, bipolar ionization technology. What it does is it releases charged atoms, and those atoms attach and deactivate harmful substances that are within our air. And that has already been proven effective with other types of viruses, SARS, uh, norovirus, and several other influential strands. So this is in addition to the work that we're already in place with our uh, filters that we re are replacing throughout the school year. Uh, this will give us the ability to provide the sa safe schools for the instructions that our, st our students are looking for. In addition to that, we have three large uh, HVA system replacements, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, that will start at Mariposa Elementary and then Manatee and Forest Grove uh, Elementary as well, uh, Forest Grove Middle School, sorry. In addition, we had some lessons learned uh, from Hurricane Jean and Francis, and that was carpeting and the dampness of the carpet. So you can see the schools we have outlined. Uh, we'll be replacing the carpeting with a VCT, which is a finished flooring material used in primarily commercial and in institutional applications. Uh, maintenance on that type of solution is much easier for us to maintain. And when we ha did have water intrusion or any of those types of accidents, we're able to clean them up really uh, efficiently. What that will not replace in carpeting, there are some rooms such as band rooms, chorus rooms that do require from a sound uh, perspective that we maintain carpeting in those types of classrooms. Our next department that would be working with some of the funding would be our ITS department. Um, we'll be working on laptops and power adapters, laptop charging carts, and Microsoft licensing for education. We're going to be replacing about 15,000 of our laptops at our middle school to high school level, so 7 through uh, 12. A lot of that um, we replaced from last year was the kindergarten through sixth grade. So this will be for the 7th through 12th. These are a little beefier type of uh, device um, because of the CTE and the re um, software requirements for us to replace from that. In addition to that, we'll have about 5,000 of them will be for our teacher laptops, which will allow for better of the collaboration, the Microsoft Teams video, those types of uh, work as well. Another project out of that is our laptop charging carts. So this year we rolled out a lot of our laptops and we want to give the opportunity for, to secure them from an inventory perspective, but also having a charging station where the students can go ahead and rack their um, laptop so they can be powered up during the day. We can make sure if they do run out of power, there's a charging station for those students. The last one was a recommendation as we talked with principals, uh, which was the Microsoft licensing uh, for a function inside Microsoft Teams that allows teachers and educators to use the collaborative portion of the phone system to be able to call parents, whether their cell phones are local or long distance. The teachers are able to leverage that to continue their contact with um, the parents uh, from that perspective. So we went ahead and added that to our fundings on the ITS. The, an example of the laptop carts for you. And then last one is a group, uh, the custodial group and some of the schools for the PPE if we required. Um, we didn't get to talk much about, but our custodial group has done an outstanding job this year making sure our facilities were safe. And it really epitomizes our mission statement, safe and caring schools. This is the group, whether it was during the day, late at evenings, or weekends, that we're making sure that our schools maintain that safe air quality wiping down. So. In our custodial teams, obviously we'll be replacing for next year gloves, hand sanitizers, Lysol disinfectant wipes, our e-mist solutions that we use to spray down the schools, and you can read the rest from that. 
Those would be the projects under operations that we'll be looking to move quickly on so that when students return after the summer, we continually provide them a safe, caring school. Dr. Wild. Are there any questions? The counselors, uh, with us being supplementing some of their um, expenses, mm -hmm. do you have any idea what that supplement looks like? Yes, um, thank you for that. We do pay for two thirds of their tu tuition and all of their books. Okay. And this is at FAU? This is at FAU. Mm -hmm. It's their counseling program, which just yesterday won an award for being one of the best uh, counseling programs in the country. And um, we know the quality of the education the counselors get at that program, um, which is why we chose to partner with FAU when we wrote that grant. We wrote it together. And um, it's allowing us to, to um, see a stream of 75 graduates um, in the, over the course of the next few years. Now, is that just directed to counselors, or is that directed to anyone who may be an employee that want to go into counseling that has a four-year degree already and would like to do that? That's correct. Anybody who has a four-year degree already that would like to apply, and then we do a joint application period because they have to get into <coughs> FAU's program, meet all the criteria to get in, um, and then commit to work to a, for us for three years after their graduation date, minimum of three years. Okay. And how long would that take? That uh, is it online? It's a combination of, well, it went online after COVID. Uh, previously, it was a combination, and it will go back to that. The current cohort is around 30 students. The next one will be 15, and the last one will be 30. Dr. Wild, I heard uh, a couple of concerns about the program. Um, is there an internship that takes place, and are we going to be able to pay them for that internship? Yes, uh, I know there were um, people were nervous about how they were going to do that because I experienced it myself as a counselor. You do have to really commit to give the hours to both a practicum and an internship, and some of you know that as well. Um, and that's what we're planning on doing as, as part of the proposal today was to pay for them to be able to do an internship. So we will replace their current position and allow them to focus on that internship time so they can complete the program without that stress and without trying to do two jobs at once. Mm -hmm. Previously, they could do a one semester internship spread over a year, which makes it doable, but this will do two things. It'll help them complete it. With a well, focused. I know a lot of teachers were concerned about, you know, losing that paycheck while they were doing the internship right. and, you know, how does this work out and what's right. the benefit of it? So, no, I appreciate that and yes. the clarification there. Thank you. I believe Ms. Richardson has a question as well. Thank you. Thank you. I do. Um, the, one of the things you mentioned was teacher support. Dr. Weil, um, could you, I, I, I kind of lost what you were saying. Okay, um, there were a couple things with teacher support. Thank you for your question, Mrs. Richardson. One of them was the teacher's aides at every school um, because that gives another person in the classroom with them. And we schedule that so that they can come in during small group instruction um, based on that classroom's needs. So it could be math time, but it's usually in the area of reading. So um, we'll, that will be teacher support as well as providing content support in math and reading. So that will be adding a math specialist to support the district. Right now we have two in grades K through 12, so it'll allow us to have a middle school person as well to increase that content level support um, as well as in reading. And then um, also someone to support the coaches themselves and the interventionist. Because I did mention an interventionist for every school, and that is a teacher who works directly with students for remediation and intervention. They'll be specially trained to utilize our programs. We have, a, we have an intervention program in reading that requires specialized training. Um, so that, too, helps the teachers. And so we will do ongoing training for both the instructional coaches and the interventionists and the teacher's aides. Did it's that help? going to be for the next two years because that's what we're using the CARES Act money. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. 
terms of, I, I did like that question um, that um, Mr. Ingersoll asked about the interns. Now, I, I, it's important that, especially like uh, Mr. Um, Tomlinson said about getting, making sure that the kids are ready mentally, I guess, for going back to school come August. So the psychologists, do we have enough psychologists on hand that could, that's going to be able to take care of the influx or the need? Mrs. Richardson, Mr. Tomlinson is coming up to the podium. Just one second. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson, for that question. We never have enough school psychologists. I'll be honest and frank about that. We're constantly working to fill our positions, but we do have about 20 of those uh, positions currently on staff, and they would be continuing to work. This would be that their willingness to work because they're 11-month employees, so we would offer them additional hours throughout the summer to continue to work. But the support that we're looking to provide for children as they're re-entering back into the summer program would be to offer this also to our certified guidance counselors in schools for them to have the opportunity because they're always the first responder for mental health in a school. So giving them that great opportunity to come back in, build relationships with children, and to continue that work that they do so well throughout the school year. Our certified counselors, they How? have the, do they have their um, master's degree? When the current certified yes. counselors. It's required. Okay. Mr. Tomlinson, I know we've concentrated on mental health, but what about OT and speech? I mean, a lot of our students missed out on nine months of speech and OT. Are we doing something over the summer with them? And are we, are we, obviously we always need more of those too because the private sector swoops them up pretty quickly. Right. We're in, thank you, Mr. Ingersoll. That is, that's an excellent point because we're in constant um, competitive factor with the private sector for these specialized positions such as occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech and language pathologists. But we, our students that have those services and they, in order to receive them, it must be part of their individualized education plan. We do have staff on board to do the summer program for these children and we talked about the possibility through ESSER 3 or through the recovery plan to actually look at increasing the number of those staff that we have through a contractual basis where we could have more to lessen the load because those students do need fine and gross motor development. Language development is the key to reading. So if we can increase and improve the options for those kids, the better outcome they will have. Okay, so we're going to contract it. Okay, yeah. Ms. Richardson, another question? Um, I was just going to pretty much go in the direction that Mr. Ingersoll was going, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Mr. If I could ask him uh, uh, one. Quick question. I, I noticed in, in our ESC and student services when you went through everything and uh, the programs were going to increase, I, I didn't see anything. And thank you for clarifying what an interventionist, uh, interventionist does and everything. I still don't understand it completely, but uh, n nowhere that I see, and I'm, some, I'm pretty well familiar with our ESC programs and things, uh, but uh, nowhere that I see anything about a behavior, behavioral tech or behavior tech, which many school systems employed, do we still have them? And yes. what is their function? I didn't see anything about a behavior tech, which I think would be a, a very important part of these programs. It's an excellent point, Mr. Kelly, and we have been increasing the number of behavior techs already that we have in the district. That's been coming to us through other sources that we have. We pay for behavior tech specifically for students with disabilities out of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. We've also increased the number through the referendum and through the mental health allocation. So, and Title I does that as well for other students. Okay, and what is the function of the behavior tech in comparison to an interventionist or the ESC teacher? Or what's the, be, you know? the behavior tech can offer immediate support in the classroom to the teacher because they're trained in many cases. We, we try to get them through all of our training programs through applied behavior analysis so that they understand the function of the behavior, why the child is acting the way they're acting, or what that behavior is saying to us, 
they then can go in, increase the opportunity to work to teach replacement behavior to that child so that they are being able to better engage in the learning environment and not have to be removed. If we can keep them in that classroom, teach them different approaches to learning, then they're better off than being removed from that. I'll, uh, I'll give you a call and we'll talk about it some more. Appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> not appropriate, I, I'm new so it's not, I don't wanna do anything that's inappropriate here. You guys all know all this stuff. Okay. We do have one more question from Ms. Richardson. Jen? Um, actually, my question would be about the replacing of the HVAC. Um, how did we come up with um, these three schools? How did we choose these schools? And um, do we, um, are there any other schools that are kind of like borderline that needs to be, I mean, I'm sure you've done your research, but, you know, kind of brought up to standard because we are going full uh, back into brick and mortar. Thank you for that question, Ms. Richardson. Actually, absolutely, this is uh, part of our one five-year, 10-year, and 15-year plan of replacements of systems that we have in schools. So things like HVAC systems have a um, cycle in which we replace them. This gives us the ability to really move our plans a little forward and catch up on uh, those types of systems. It's just like painting and, and roof, we have a plan um, to replace those or modify them when necessary. Also, these schools, these three schools, their, their HVAC systems are 30 years old. They all came on at Correct. the same time, um, Forest Grove and Mariposa and uh, Manatee. And so when we present to the board our 20-year capital plan, we have it laid out and, um, you, know, what, what, who's on, you know, who's next, uh, as you mentioned there. And these are the three schools that are really next. So we'll be able to um, utilize these dollars from the federal government uh, to speed that process up. Uh, but those schools are next in line because they're, uh, I don't want to show my age, but I would open two of them. So um, uh, Forest Grove, and then we were housed one year at, um, at uh, Manatee, and uh, Southport was housed at uh, Mariposa before um, those schools opened up as well. So it, uh, they're, uh, they're needed, the repair is needed there, uh, the replacement, not just a repair, but a replacement. Mr. Ingersoll? Um, this is going to be pretty tricky. You know, what is, you know, what goes to CARES Act, what goes to, to normal school funding? Are we hiring an extra accountant to help this department out? We're looking at, um, we've had those conversations with the different departments uh, based upon what the, uh, Michelle sitting over there, if, the, if that's going to be a need. We've got a great department. We're on, you know, we have skeleton crews as it is right now. so. Um, We'll make sure that we have those conversations. Similar to what we did for uh, the COVID relief, we brought on Bridget to brought her, brought her on board to monitor the students and Bill monitors the adults. Um, we'll be taking a look at that in our departments to see, because what we have to make sure is that we can um, then keep them after three years when that funding goes, goes away. So like when we talk about contracted services, that's easy. When we look at some of the other ones and bringing on AIDS, there's attrition, there's people that leave and go out. Um, so we'll, we'll, leave, uh, we'll definitely take a look at that. Because um, I have every confidence in what they're doing, and uh, Mich Michelle is, you know, does a remarkable job with her team. Uh, so to just be, if it's needed, we'll take care of it. It's just scary because you know the COVID situation brought on another position, and you know this is just like a whole new animal. I mean, you're mm -hmm. talking about another forty million dollars, and you know, plus, plus, plus. And it's not just. It's also Michelle. Raise your hand so I want everybody to see. And it's also Rod. Where's Rod? Rod okay. Nada in the back. So they work together. They work very closely and some of their staffs as well. And there's nobody better than those two. Um, Rod is the guru. And um, if he says this is the way it is, you know, I've, he's, Rod, I'm not gonna jinx you, but he's never been wrong. Um, at least I'm not work. saying they're wrong. At I'm least they work. Everybody else no. is getting help except for the accounting department. And, and so, uh, like I said, we'll take care of anybody that has an additional need, we'll be able to, uh, to take care of them. The other thing is, is fixed costs covered through this because you know, obviously we're doing busing, and how are we appropriating money to, I mean, we charge $3 a mile for other agencies. Are we charging like $3 a mile to CARES Act, or how is, how is this situation going to work out, or if we're still trying to figure that out? The transportation piece that we're covering in CARES is specific to the transportation needed for summer school or after school tutoring, so we're able to separate that accounting. 
And, and same with electricity and, and our fixed costs and our buildings, because obviously we wouldn't open up all our buildings, but we'd open up like five or six of them. So are, are we going to We're not charging those fixed costs to trans, uh, to the CARES Act I and would. the ESSER too? <laughs> well, there's some there's no. some limitations on what's allowable in that regard. Okay. Okay. For we are providing transportation from our schools to other programs during the summer. We correct? are, yes. yes. Free of charge. Yes. You are correct, Dr. Mills. We are. Okay. Where typically we would charge, like, uh, you know, right. different things. So for the summer program, we are not charging. Um, we felt like that, you know, we, and we've, we've got over 4,000 students signed up right now, which is great. Our, student, our school and principal has been doing a remarkable job with that. And uh, so we know that parents still work after 2 o'clock or 2.30, they went out. So we are going to transport for free. We're transporting to school. Everything is free. No, no expense to, uh, to students or families. And we have a list of the Children's Services Council agencies that have asked to be part of that. And when the parent registers for summer school, they get that list and they can choose to ask for that transportation on the spot. It's part of our, we built it into the system. I know you guys have thought about this, but this was a scare I was thinking about this morning, long term. This is more like geared towards Terrence's department, Mr. Leary's department in IT. Is um, We rolled out to Westwood and we rolled out to Port St. Lucie High School computers and, and we did a great job collecting a deposit and obviously the students, you know, took care of those. Um, and now the whole district has it. You know, we set the bar high now with the CARES Act. How are we going to continue this long term? Are we going to eventually start charging students, not charging, taking a deposit or taking insurance money, whatever that we called it? Are we going to start doing that within the next few years? What's our long term goal? Have we planned sure. that out? Excellent question, um, Mr. Ingersoll. So, yes, we have programs in place. A lot of the laptops we bought with extended warranties so that we knew coming into this there would be about a 1% uh, broke fix is what we call it. Um, has that increased since we increased the amount of them? Absolutely. So through warranty, those types of things, we do have that available. We also lost chargers and those types of things. We do, part of our agreement with the parent is that if they do lose it, we do have a charge for that. We have an online system uh, through uh, school pay that parents can go ahead and, and um, cover that cost uh, for us, but again, a lot of that thought was up before we designed it to make sure that warranties were in place. The largest, you know, broke fix might be the screens. Um, you know, that's our largest broke fix at this point. So yes, that is part of our plan. And us, it's also part of the refresh program, is making sure we're refreshing out all of the devices. That will be a challenge as we brought many of those devices on. Um, and we're working through that process of what that new refresh program looks like. Um, so we're leveraging the dollars that we have right now and building a program uh, to accommodate that for the future. Okay. What's going to scare me is um, once the governors and the powers that be in the state start seeing how we're spending our money, they're going to start looking at budgeting elsewhere. So that, that is always my concern when we start receiving these type of capabilities, I should say. So just, just be aware. So in other words, when you start seeing everyone has a, a laptop, then you're going to see your textbook adoption money get decreased because no longer are you buying as many textbooks because now they'll all be online, assumably. Except the online resources do cost more than the textbooks. <laughs> So that me and you know that, we, but we will need to work to communicate that with them for sure. Thank sure. you. Thank you. The question, uh, Mr. Ingersoll, you ask is a good question, and that's why we're anxious to see what um, what this year's budget looks like. And I know it's um, the session ends this week. There'll be a um, I know they'll come back for gambling in a couple of weeks, but we're hopeful that, uh, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, that we have enough information to go ahead and start moving forward um, with, with that. I think, uh, Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, that 90% of the dollars were supposed to go directly to the school districts? Yes. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how that, how that works out. Um, we know that the governor <coughs> threw in, uh, and I think it's coming from CARES, and I could be wrong, you know, um, $1,000 for principals and for teachers. Um, but 
there's a ton of other staff as well that are out there. So we really want to we want to um, take a close look at that and uh, and see, um, you know, hopefully there's going to be some flexibility from this year's budget. There's been very little in the past few years, um, and that. Um, you know, we're very, very careful over the three years to make sure that we don't staff and then we don't, you know, and then let's say you have all these positions and you can't afford them anymore. So that's, I know that was one of the things you were alluding to, so we have to be very, very careful on that, uh, which we will be. Uh, like, like I said, we've got a proven track record with that and uh, we'll continue to do so. And I, I just want to, I, I, I appreciate the, the work that staff has done on this. This is, um, you know, a lot, but it's going to be very, very beneficial and what I wanted everyone to see in the community to see is that um, and it's going to students it's going to the schools it's going to those that have the greatest needs I think also included in here uh, we showed you some of the other schools and some of the additional resources that go into those schools was that at the very end Dr. Wild is that in the board members handouts as well yes the sir you know you'll see that at the end of presentation it's see more there it is right there um, the additional target, the targeted funding that comes from other resources. So we kind of use this as a guide and, and what we got the best bang for the buck. So that's there for the, you know, you can see 12 different additional positions at CA Moore, 15 that were at St. Lucie Elementary, and all of these came from different um, dollars, you know, whether they were grants or SIG grants or whatever, Lawnwood at seven, White City at four and a half, and Lakewood Park at eight, you know, for the equity of these schools where we have some of our greatest needs, and you see Dan McCarty and, uh, and Forest Grove as well. Um, so, and we'll, you know, and if we see, this is a, a fluid, this will be fluid as well. So if we see a school that has a specific need, um, you know, or, or a department that has a specific need, we'll be able to uh, go in and, and assist as well once, once we look at our data and see where that goes. But I want to appreciate staff. I just want to say thank you to the staff members uh, that worked very, very hard on this uh, to present it to the board. So you had a pretty good general <laughs> overview of what we're doing um, with this and uh, the public has that information as well. Our next presentation is going to be from Dr. Prince, our Deputy Superintendent, where we're going to look at, um, uh, quickly, we're going to look at your, um, the kinder, you know, we've done a major push to get our students that we, th we couldn't find, a uh, kindergarten roundup, uh, and, and the steps that we've taken uh, to, uh, to go out and, um, and work with our student assignment uh, in, uh, office, and, and Michelle, Michelle Jurger's here as well, coming up to the front, and uh, they've been out uh, beating the bushes. Dr. Prince. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, board members, Superintendent Gent. I uh, also wanted to make sure I had uh, Michelle Jurger, our Director of Student Assignment. She's uh, been in student assignment for 19 years. And I can tell you, 90% of the issues that the board brings to, to me, at least, have something to do with student assignment. So we're going to talk a little bit about Operation Kindergarten, just to keep the board updated. I'll go uh, pretty quick. It's just an FYI. You have on your tables there what we call a swag bag. It's a board of goodies or a, a bag of goodies that um, our students and families have been getting whenever they <laughs> register their child. So I just wanted to give you an update in kind of why we're trying to do this so early is right now we have about 140 different sections in kindergarten across the district with 3,156 students. We have 470 VPK kids. Right now, because of this big push, we've already enrolled 1,426 completed kindergarten applications. And the reason why we've got this big push is we had 200 plus kids that we were expecting last year that never came. And we anticipate probably the, the parents of these children were concerned, they kept them home uh, during the pandemic, and now we're anticipating those children are gonna be coming back to us and as it goes along with what Dr. Weil is saying, some of our dollars are going to be used to service these overage kindergartners to try to get them up to speed and get them back where they're supposed to go. So student assignment, I can't tell you how hard these people work. They have a, a great personalized approach to what they do. Uh, they have after-hour appointments. They do flex time. But right now, they've also been reaching out to our homeless families trying to get these children enrolled early so we have a number approximately of how many of these children we have and also uh, parents that started applications last year but never completed them they just stopped because of the pandemic we're actually reaching out to these families to try to make sure that we capture them early so that we know how many we have and we have a lot of these community events and this is kind of how we function uh, through the early learning coalition we had the Kid Mania drive through and also the Safety Festival. These are two recent events that actually we have student assignment go out there on the weekends. You know, we see little kids, oh, 
are they going into kindergarten? Let's get them over here and get them registered. A lot of our families have barriers with technology, so we really try to get with them and try to support them the best way that we can. Also, we have our partners with our VPKs. Student assignment is actually going out, and no, number one, we automatically roll those children into our kindergarten programs, but also we meet with them. We do on-site uh, registrations with our Head Start, VPK, but also the East Coast Migrant Daycares. We try to make sure that those families get supported in their native language as well. We also have hard to reach communities, and I start all, all the, uh, the time with homeless families. Uh, we work through our social workers. Many of our social workers know where these families are, so we've actually had our social workers going out and trying to assist these families to make sure they know how to register, getting out to them. We've also worked through our local churches and the food bank as well. So our kindergarten roundup, you have uh, some of the flyers that we've had. We did a full court press uh, over three days, which was last week at Sam Gaines, St. Lucie West Centennial, and Southport. And we actually served more than 120 families over th these three days. I can't commend Michelle and her team enough. Uh, these ran from 11 to 7 to try to support our families. But we're not stopping there. Also, you can see today, they are literally at St. Lucie Elementary School. And I can tell you one of our biggest marketing campaigns is not just marketing to the public, and you'll see how we did with that, but it's marketing with siblings, because uh, brothers and sisters have little brothers and sisters. And whenever, um, like at St. Lucie Elementary today, if you have a sibling family member come in and register, you're going to get that support that you need right at that school. But also the sibling of the child, let's say they're a third grade child, is going to get a new backpack and a swag bag just for recommending a sibling to try to make sure that we're really promoting that. And I want to thank those principals at these schools. You'll notice all. Uh, four corners of the county are, are um, participants. We've got North County at Lakewood Park, we've got South, we've got East, and we've got West. So our communication plan, once again, I've uh, worked very closely with Ms. Martin and Ms. Jerger. I want to thank Ms. Martin because she's done a lot of the groundwork with regards to the print media, social media, our local media, uh, our marquees, our internal TV, um, uh, TV shop. But once again, our current students are some of our best ambassadors for making sure children get registered early. And you see the print materials here. And the print materials, every one of our children in our public schools got some of the print materials and along with a letter to take home. We've really mobilized through our schools and our school principals to try to get these children in, just telling them how important so that we have an accurate number of kids so we know exactly what we're going to need to do to provide that additional support. Facebook Live, I always like to say there's my glamour shot along with Mrs. Jerger. Uh, we do Facebook Lives on Fridays and that goes through uh, Miss Martin. And uh, we did that a couple of weeks ago just to promote that and answer questions. We know a lot of our families are on social media, and it provides an opportunity for us to interface directly with them. We also, uh, Ms. Martin had reached out to the TV stations. You'll see the story very quickly that ran. Lucy County School Lucy. District, again, that's pushed to get new students registered early for the fall semester. This is the district's first day of its kindergarten roundup and new student enrollment. So think of it as a one-stop shop to get what you need to sign up and register. You can go to Samuel Gaines Academy from 11 this morning to 7 or tomorrow, St. Lucie West Centennial High. And then on Friday, that roundup will be at Southport Middle School. Parents or guardians, you should take your child's birth certificate, their shot records, and two proofs of address. This is primarily for kindergartners, sixth graders, out of zone students, also those new to the county. This year, we really wanted to recapture some of those students who sat out a year because of the pandemic. We did have a number of um, students who their parents and families decided to stay at home for another year. And so we're excited to welcome those students back into our schools. New this year, elementary schools will host a kindergarten kickoff to give those newcomers a chance to see where they're going to be going to school, maybe shake off some of those nerves, those jitters. St. Lucie Public Schools, they will return to full in-person learning this August. 
And because of the work that we've done, we're, where, we are way ahead of where we were last year with regards to enrollments and registrations for our kids. Mr. Gent also did a public service announcement. This went uh, through uh, the radio airwaves, but also it went on our splash page as well. Whenever you go to our, our, um, our splash page, our website, and you can see actually that the flyer, we turned that into an informational uh, campaign as well. Yes, Senator well. Wayne Gent yes. of St. Lucie Public Schools, inviting you to attend one of our kindergarten roundup and student enrollment events. They will take place next week from 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. on Wednesday, April 21st at Samuel Gaines Academy, Thursday, April 22nd at St. Lucie West Centennial High School, and Friday, April 23rd at Southport Middle School. This is one-stop shop where staff from the Student Assignment, Transportation, and Exceptional Student Education offices can assist you with enrolling your kindergartner or any other student who needs to register. Be sure to bring your child's original birth certificate, shot record, and two proofs of address. Any new kindergartner who registers will receive a free backpack with school supplies and current students who refer a family member or friend to enroll will receive a free swag bag. For more information, call 429-3600. We hope you'll join us at the Kindergarten Roundup next week. I can tell you, as an elementary principal, I very rarely had bad days, but if I was having a bad day, I could just walk down to a kindergarten class. Uh, lastly, We've uh, done a big push with our school marquees. You can see uh, even Weatherby up in the top right. They have an upcoming day where we're going to be registering uh, students at Weatherby along with some of the sites that I shared. Once again, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Jerger, Mrs. Martin, and all of our principals that have really promoted this. We're way far ahead of where I thought we would be at this time, but uh, it's going to be critically important for us to get these students in, make sure that they get what they need, and provide the support to get them on track, especially with our overage students. And with that, I'll take any questions, or Mrs. Jerger will. Uh, questions, right. board members? Mm -hmm. Dr. Mills? Um, you mentioned, there's a couple of things I noticed, but you mentioned that um, VPK providers, that we are going to their sites and register the students. And how do we get that done without the parent being at that site to sign off? How does that complete? the completion goes. The daycares have a parent evening mm -hmm. and they invite us on their parent evenings. Okay. Uh, more specifically, Head Start, they typically have um, some learning days that the parents have to come in. Mm -hmm. We come in at any time that they know that they're gonna have their parents on site. So we have great relationships with many of the daycare providers mm -hmm. and they will let us know when they're having one of those evenings and I make sure that I have bilingual staff there to assist every single parent. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you, Ms. Jerger. Also what I noticed on the screen was as the kindergartners are going for their orientation or going to the schools to get signed up, they're uh, getting sanitizer on their hands and they, you know, before they enter the classroom and I was just wondering, are we doing that now in our classrooms? I think that's a great idea that as students enter the class, they get a little squirt on their hands. I think Is it depends that part on, of our safety yeah. protocols? I know we have plenty of hand sanitizer that we distributed to our schools. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those class-by-class uh, -class practices. I couldn't say that it's happening in every single one of our kindergarten rooms. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea to have that happening. And not just the kindergartners, but really have the kids just take a little squirt I mean, you can't be too safe because we're still dealing with COVID. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, real quick, I just want to mention at this point, because it's the proper time, uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Gent, and your staff. Uh, talk about instant gratification. There was a couple of things I brought up being new. <laughs> I don't know if I did them at the right time or not, but uh, this kindergarten, uh, roundup thing what the commun communications department has done with you uh, just fantastic I, I love this stuff they, they, they did a great job it's it's everywhere everywhere I, I look uh, the other thing was I asked about maybe at one of these meetings we could do something about the zones the red blue and green zones well Mrs. Michelle Jurger uh, did a thing on, on our TV station explained everything uh, completely I mean, it couldn't be better, and uh, and that was instant. I just not even a month after I talked about it, and uh, 
And I want to compliment Michelle because she does it with a smile. She's got a great demeanor, you know, did a great job. And uh, the other thing was I asked, uh, three days before we had the other meeting, I, I asked you about if we could showcase the young lady from the Boys and Girls Club who won the, the big award. And you guys did it uh, uh, instantly. I mean, you had a picture of her in the, uh, on the bulletin on the second page, and it just, it, she was just, uh, and so was the Boys and Girls Club. They were so uh, grateful for what we did, and, but you did it so quick. So uh, you guys are great, the staff, and you have done a great job, and uh, I'm very pleased. <laughs> I just, uh, and so quick, and uh, without, uh, so I don't need anything further. <laughs> On what I requested, you guys acted quick, and I, I appreciate everyone, the staff and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Our, our, Thank our you. staff is, they're, they're awesome. You get to learn that, bring new in, in, in every department. And uh, that's, you know, that's one of our, um, our, our pillars. That's one of our, that's part of our culture. And uh, so, uh, and then coming in as, an, as a new board member and recognizing that and seeing that and complimenting them is, uh, we really appreciate that. Thanks you, again. I do want to thank Ms. Jur. I mean, obviously, this has been a rough year for everybody, particularly a student assignment, trying to figure out which kids are going to what school, my school, home school, and, and their staff has done a phenomenal job making sure that all these uh, kids' needs are met from transportation to, to student assignment, and, and it has been seamless. And, and it's just because, because of her leadership. Thank you, Ms. Dreger. Yeah, she's fantastic. She's um, 19 years, and she's got the answer. And uh, she'll have the answer real quick for you. And, uh, and uh, she's right. She's always right, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I left one person out, Lydia Martin. I know this all comes under her, and yep. uh, she, great job. She's so professional. She does her job Thank well. You. Thank you. Yes, she does. Madam Chair, we'll move on to our final item, which will be our required instruction in culturally responsive teaching. We made a presentation to the board uh, on uh, September the 22nd, seven months ago. Uh, we have two new board members on now. I know that they've reviewed and looked over that. Uh, it did come up to kind of where are we at now and, and where are we headed. And so what we wanted to do was to take the last part of the, uh, we put this on um, late because we only had a two weeks notice uh, to do this. And so I want to uh, compliment OTL and the department for scrambling. This is their busiest time of the year as we're getting ready for summer school, the legislative session, um, and trainings for, for folks. Um, I also had asked, um, when we were having these conversations, I, um, I always go out and meet with my principals in small groups, and I think it's important. And, and the principals will hopefully tell you in private that they know that they can say whatever they need to say and uh, because that's the only way we can improve and, and to move forward, whether, whatever the issue might be. So I formed a small little focus group of uh, principals um, to kind of look over what we're doing and, and to get their input and to where we need it to go. I have them in the room right now, so I just wanted to introduce them. I've got uh, Mona Ray Buchanan, who's um, principal at Central right now, was at Forest Grove before that. Michelle Harrington at St. Lucie Elementary, who um, is a turnaround principal and has done a remarkable job. It's a model school for turnaround. Uh, at St. Lucie Elementary, if you look at their numbers for summer school, I think they've got over 200 and how many? Over 200 kids that are going to be coming back into summer school. Lexi Laudis, who's uh, two, uh, two, second year over at uh, White City, and Lexi was an AP over at uh, Sam Gaines Academy before that and responsible for the part of that team as the turnaround at the school center. Um, Roberto Bonsignor, Roberto started at White City, was over at Gaines, and is now at Savannah Ridge. And uh, Eldry Gardner, who's uh, six, finishing his sixth year at St. Lucie West K-8 in an A-rated school. Marcy Lucky can't be here today. Um, and then Anna Rodriguez. Anna is uh, finishing, is this is your fourth or fifth? Yes. Fifth year at the Allapata Flats. She also served the second semester on the superintendent's cabinet. And so what I do is I reach out to them, we talk. They don't hold back, they'll, they'll, they'll tell it like it is. And, uh, so they've been very instrumental in, in assuring us and looking at uh, what we're doing, and um, not only with this topic, but uh, uh, what the gains that we've made in this school district over the last six years would not have occurred without the without strong leadership from the principals, and and what they've done, and and uh, and what we've entrusted them to do, and in our teachers and all of our staff members. So I, I appreciate them uh, being here. I know they're ready to to bolt to get back to their school center because it's a critical time. But I I wanted to recognize them, Dr. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Gent. 
I'm happy to have the opportunity to present on this topic. And I, too, want to echo Mr. Gent's comments about our principles. Their, their input and feedback is really invaluable to us. And before I get into this content, the Office of Teaching and Learning includes um, the professional development and the curriculum department. And I want to recognize two of our leaders in those departments. I have Liz Pruitt, who is coordinator of curriculum. And next to her, Dee Dee Campbell, who is the coordinator of talent development. And they've been uh, very helpful with this work and will continue to be. So um, as you were pointing out, Mr. Kelly, we are all about continuous improvement and continuing to get better. We never feel like we're done with the work. So this is an update to our September 22nd presentation that we did. We will review just a little bit to get everybody on the same page, and then we'll go into um, some of the standards changes that are happening, our uh, current content and practices, what we're going to do to help our principals based on their feedback, monitor this instruction, um, and also what our next steps are, are going to be as we move forward. And one of our focus areas going forward is going to be to drastically increase our training in the area of culturally responsive um, teaching and classroom environments. I know some of you have participated in our diversity and equity training, which was our first step. And we're, as we go forward, we want to make sure to utilize the research that's out there now, the brain research, on how important it is to connect to our students' background knowledge. And that relates to their culture, their life experiences, and their languages, especially in such a diverse school district. This is really just the timeline to remind everybody that we have required course standards in every course, K through 12. And we are getting ready to transition to the new best standards. So you can see in the middle there, the K through 2 teachers next year will have all new standards, all new materials um, for English language arts. And then the following year, all ELA, English language arts, and math teachers will have new standards. So those um, training opportunities are starting now and will continue over the course of the next couple years. Um, so just want to remind everybody how important the transitioning successfully to the new standards are, because this is where the success of our students academically um, lies. In addition to those required course standards in every course, there are 26 additional items under uh, the statute that outlines additional required instruction. And so teachers are required to teach this content using the prescribed books and the methods that we give to them. But with that, the State Department of Education does try to align standards to these required elements. So they're placed in certain courses, unless they are unique situations like Flag Day, which is one day, all grades. So those types of, of items. Just take a minute and look at the required instructional aspects. These are the 26 items. Um, for those of you that were on the board last year, we did a presentation on the additional ones of mental health, substance abuse, and child trafficking. They were added. But all of these are required by the school systems to um, embed within their curriculum. And I want to call attention to the five that I have highlighted because they do interrelate. The, if you would look at the right-hand side, top right-hand side, the history of African Americans is outlined a little differently than the others in that it explicitly outlines what periods of time we are required to cover um, regarding political conflicts that led to the development of slavery, the passage to America, the enslavement experience, abolition, and the contribution of African Americans to society. And then under that, you can see Hispanic contributions is listed separately, and then women. And what you see is the statue and the letter. So if you're referring back to the previous page, those are from that. And the history of the Holocaust is another uh, very important one, also aligned in social studies classes. But I wanted to highlight this is where teaching our students about prejudice and racism and stereotyping, that is embedded in the Holocaust part of the required instruction, as well as in the character education component. So that is why we, I selected those five for this slide today. 
So how do we address these required instructional elements? We do outline them in our district scope and sequence. Uh, the district scope and sequence is what tells our teachers what they have to teach when at, one, at what speed so that everyone stays on, on track to finish the course by the end of the year. Um, the instructional calendars and all of the tools that we give our teachers are, is the first place where we embed the required instructional components. And then it's also something we're very conscious of in all of our curriculum selections. And then also in our diverse classroom libraries, which I mentioned earlier today, and in our media centers, making sure that our text selections are diverse and students see themselves and role models in their, their independent reading materials. And then in addition with Canvas, our learning management system, we are also able to give lessons to our teachers um, digitally. This is just an example, and I know on your slide it looks a little different, and you'll see why. It's because this is a list of different resources um, that our teachers have readily available. This is in, their, in all of our tools where they go to see what they have available to them to teach. The standards are outlined here. So the first one on this is, it's a unit on Langston Hughes. I believe this is fifth grade. And this is just a sample. Every grade level has this. The teachers can click on these. These are live links for the teachers. And then what comes up is a larger explanation of the standard and some steps for how to teach it. And then they click on another area. And then this particular example is a unit assessment that has questions related to the lesson they just had. I know that was a question that has come up. Uh, do we test the students on the standards that are aligned to this required instructional element? And we do, and this is actually in an English language arts class. And I'll elaborate on that in a few more slides. This is a middle school world history lesson and activity. Social studies is where these standards primarily live. And you can see this particular course, it's the impact of the Nile River on Egyptian life. So um, this would be in sixth grade, this example. And if a teacher collect, uh, clicks on one of these links, they get this text, which is about African kingdoms. And they then have the lesson that goes along with that. And then here is another resource for the teachers. A lot of times it's live video links so they can make the curriculum come to life for the students. And this is about kings and queens. This is what uh, the scope and sequence instructional calendars look like. And I don't know if you can see that, but you have a hard copy. This is a middle school example. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the required instruction is um, listed there, and this particular one is about the Holocaust. And the next example is a high school social studies um, calendar. And again, it's in the bottom right-hand corner with what resources are there for that required instructional element. These are all current resources. In addition, we, we expanded what the current textbooks provide us for the authors in, in within the ELA textbooks, the English language arts textbooks, so that the teachers could spend time telling the students about the contributions of the individuals who wrote these various passages and stories. And so we've provided video links, and this is all within Canvas for our teachers. This here is just a sample assignment for you. Um, you'll see that some of the required instructional elements overlap. So if it's an African-American woman, for example, that automatically is going to cover women's studies and African-American. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. So this is a, a passage that the teachers have that they can utilize, as well as the quiz questions that are already created for them. So I said I would get back to the unit assessment topic. With the unit assessments, uh, those are assessments that are district created that are given at the end of every unit of study in our core classes, and they are aligned to the standards. So I mentioned that the social studies standards are where most of this alignment takes place, where the state 
connects this required instruction to. So it's really heavier in some grade levels than others. So sixth grade social studies, seventh and eighth, they all have some standards related to these topics, as well as it's very heavy in world history and US history. So in those courses, these are examples of unit assessment questions where we do test those standards and this content. And this is a list of those standards in two of the courses I just mentioned. And then you can see that we would then align a, a unit assessment question to those standards. But we do go beyond that because I mentioned in my presentation in September that another thing that we do to address the required instruction elements is select text passages and stories for our students in English language arts so that they can be exposed more often than just when they're in those social studies courses. So we also, in English language arts, do unit assessments. And although it won't be on the content necessarily, it's on their comprehension of what they read. So the questions will be about contributions of African Americans, Hispanics, the Holocaust period, or any one of those other 26 required instructional elements. And these are some examples of units where the, the passages themselves on the unit assessments uh, relate to African American, as an example. Another place we would be remiss if we did not mention that a lot of the content related to um, diversity and equity and relationships in the classroom um, fall into the social emotional learning curriculum. And so many of the required instructional elements are in the SEL curriculum, as we call it. And they are spread out in all grade levels. We do have three different curriculums, actually four, because we had um, Safe and Smarter Schools and, Sa and um, Sanford Harmony, as well as Lions Quest. And then Freshman Seminar has a curriculum. We also have Suite 360 that also touches on these requirements. We always have to celebrate um, the positives, and we are still one of nine districts recognized um, by the Commissioner of Education African American History Task Force. They have not updated this. I mentioned to you in September, we keep contacting them. They have not, uh, but we continue to update our work so that when they do, we can stay on that list, because um, that is important to us. And this is just a supplementary resource that we have on our website for our teachers. And we keep it updated every year. They can use them any time of year. Um, but in the left-hand column, those are live links that our teachers can go to, and lesson plans are there for them. And, and really, these are just some supplementing everything that's already in their toolboxes. We want to continue to get better and implement new strategies. And our principals were a great help when we put this together and gave us feedback on what would help them. Because although those items were in the calendars, we want to call our teachers' attention to them more and really make sure that they see them and they understand their requirement. To there's, These are not optional lessons. These cannot be skipped. So we're moving them. So one of the strategies we're going to do is move them to the top so they're the first thing they see and make them hot links. So they will all go straight to the, to the source and to the um, text that the teachers would need or the Canvas lesson. We are also, I mentioned Nearpod um, several times before. It is an amazing software program. It is so interactive. And these are just some of the titles that we just pulled. I was on it yesterday, and there's new titles being added every day. And these are lessons for teachers that are completely laid out. They tell them exactly what to do, what to say. There's videos to engage the students. There's songs. Um, and they are celebrating the contributions of various individuals. And, and honestly, there's content in this software platform for all of those uh, required instructional elements that we mentioned. Also, to help our principals, because principals are the ones in the classrooms and in the planning sessions um, working with our teachers. They are the ones responsible for monitoring instruction. So we are developing tools for them to help them do that. And we went through these tools with this illustrious group, and they told us what would help them and um, that these would be useful. So this first one is a sample document of shows all 26 required instructional elements. And it's a, it's a high level view of everything that is required to be taught in K through 12 and where it sits. 
So they can find that if they need it. We're going to have that available to them. And uh, we'll be doing some training on this in June. Um, this is another way to look at it by month. So each month they will see which of the required elements are expected to be taught. So um, you're aware that our principals do instructional walkthroughs all of the time. And when they do that, they pull up the standards that the teachers are supposed to be teaching. And this will be an extra tool that they can take in to make sure that they don't miss something that is supposed to be taught. Um, but they told us this will be their most valuable tool, Co right? Correct. And um, this will come out a month before uh, the next month where we will tell them in each grade level what you should see this month in each grade level. And we'll also give this to the teachers as well. So when they are doing their collaborative planning, they will know these are the text that we're, we're not going to be picking and choosing. These are, these are important to the, to the curriculum. Although we take feedback from teachers and we'll continue to expand this, we want to make sure they're aware of what is um, absolutely required. Again, this is the scope and sequence. I talked about this before, but you'll see where it's circled there. Um, this is an example of what we're going to do for every single unit. We're going to put a symbol in so that there's no question that the teacher sees that this is a required instructional element. So that is um, going to really help our teachers and our principals as well. And I just zoomed in and it a little closer here. And you can see that um, where the little hand is, next to the, the blue wording, the little hand right now is our, our placeholder. That's our symbol that will show the teacher, like this unit, you need to make sure that you teach this. And then the, the links are blue because they're, they're live links and they take the teacher to where they need to go. And I mentioned uh, collaborative planning, and the, the principal said this is um, really an important aspect to their ability to monitor instruction. Because this is the cycle that our teachers go through when they plan a unit or plan a lesson. They do look at their learning targets. They plan for the learning. They deliver instruction, but it's not over. They come back together. They analyze the student work. What did the students do? Did they learn what we expected them to learn? Then they plan the reteaching, which would include remediation if needed or whole class review. And then they keep going and they go through this cycle. And you can see the classroom visits at the bottom. This is, this is not a new document. This is our CLP cycle that we train on. We make sure our coaches understand it because they help lead this work as well. Um, but while this cycle is going on, the principals and the assistant principals and the coaches are involved in this cycle. They're there with the teachers while they plan. They walk and observe the lesson. They see if it came out the way it was intended to. This is a way that our teachers can continue to grow and learn. So it's really job embedded professional development. But it helps the principals also monitor instruction. And then, as you know, we are required to report that we do all of this instruction, all 26 elements, and where we do it to the state. And uh, Liz Pruitt is the point person on reporting this, and she does have to go into a state database and list every single standard and resource that is used in all 26 items, and she does it twice a year. So what we're adding to this is um, the, t the principals will be participating in this as, as well, and twice a year they will go through this list and make sure that they're verifying that these things are taught on the school campus. So not only is this about monitoring and an accountability, it's about awareness, making sure that this doesn't fall off of anybody's radar. It's not a one-year initiative. It is ongoing. And then culturally responsive teaching. We did start this year with uh, diversity and equity training, but we're going to be moving forward and get really deeper with the teachers on culturally responsive teaching. This is just one author. Um, there's many renowned experts in this field. Um, and this is to build upon what we did this year uh, with Dr. Ella Thompson. And I appreciate some of you were able to attend some of her sessions as well. And we welcome that. And um, Dr. Thompson has done some work with our principals on examining equity and implicit bias. But she has also now worked with our student services department and done five sessions with our deans looking at discipline practices. 
She did help our talent development department in building out this course for our teachers. And um, we have just under 2,000 teachers that have completed the required elements of this course with very positive feedback. And then we're expanding it into the culturally responsive education realm, um, both through online at your own pace training and face-to-face -face training that will take place um, beginning this summer and into uh, the beginning of next year as well. And like I've mentioned, we are working to continuously improve, making sure that our curriculum is culturally relevant and that our stu students and teachers are also aware and um, make sure that we cover all of this content effectively and for the best for our student body. Are there any questions? I believe that is the last slide. Okay. Um, first, I wanna thank the principals who are here today um, and have helped to give insight to the district uh, it's been, uh, have come up within the community that uh, the African American um, emerging of the core classes have, uh, the ch have not been done. And so the community is pretty, I, won't, I have to say maybe even upset. You notice there's quite a few people that are here today. Um, and what they are asking for is stronger accountability. Now, this presentation was great, as always. You do a very good job at the presentation and what is actually happening. And one of the points that you made today was there's always room for improvement. And what we are getting the feedback from the children within the black community is that all they hear about is slavery, oppression, uh, being mistreated. And so uh, Bill Thomason, I'm sure he understands as well as the rest of us the importance, and you mentioned it, mental health and dealing with cultures and norms and individuals being able to see people of their own culture the contributions that they made to really make this country great. And I think what's been happening maybe is that there's been, an, there's been um, we've been top heavy in one area because the, the state does say that you must teach the history, you know, and the slavery and all of that. And we, our kids need to know the entire history. All of our children need to know that. But all of our children also need to know about the extreme wonderful contributions that African Americans have made to this country and continue to make and the power that's in that culture and that race. And so I think it's been a little top heavy in one area because the kids are coming back and saying we don't learn nothing about nobody but Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and, and, and the civil rights movement and it's all negative that they feel they're getting. So as a district in improving, which I see you guys did a lot of work before you got here today. I'm very proud of that work that you have done, especially getting the insight from our principals of how we can improve and move forward and be better with our students because we want our um, black males to be understand just how powerful they really are because we as a people, we come over here the wrong way our ancestors. We came over here the wrong way and all of that, that all of our rights were taken, we understand that. But in the midst of all of that, we were still able to raise up in a very powerful way and make a very powerful difference. Extreme inventors, extreme scientists, extreme mathematicians, extreme whatever teachers, we need to, our children need to hear more of that. So what my hope is, is that we continue to improve and do this, is that we become top heavy in that area. Just the opposite. Because what that will do, as I mentioned before, it will help our children academically. It will help in the area of behavior problems. I know because I've done it and I've made tremendous um, uh, transformations just in giving the history to our young people. So um, 
again, this is thank you for your work because I see that you have done a tremendous job to bring it, bring truth to where we're at and where we need to go. And uh, we want some form, the, the community, some form of stronger um, accountability. They do not want their children coming home saying we don't know nothing about nobody that did nothing positive hardly. All the, everybody was terrible and, and mistreated our people and, and they still are like that. And you know, you know what we're going through now as a country. So we've got to do something here in St. Lucie County to do our part and to, to change some of this stuff around, you know, and deal with it. And that's what you're doing. You, that's what you're all doing. You're facing the situation and, and doing what we can to improve. And there's a lot of improvement that can be done. But we, we definitely, and, and thank you for the things that you've said in regards to what we're implementing now. Right. You know, I heard that loud and clear. We are implementing some new stuff to, to bring it closer to the reality of what our children need. Thank you, Dr. Mills. And thank the, the people that's out here, because I know why you're out here. Um, and um, there was a misconception in the community uh, that had went around saying that we were trying, as a district, was taking African American history and the curriculum out of the district. And that is not so. What we're looking to do is to improve the accountability part of ensuring that our children are getting what they need to get in the education. Now, our kids, all of our kids, not just the African American child, we all need it. Our, our, and the same thing with the Hispanic culture. And our white children, they need to understand the power of the African American. Not the, all of the oppression and always being the one down and, you know, and how, they, how they were treated. That's important because as the Jewish people say, never forget that's important that the people know where we come, all the people know from which we come from as a country so that we will not go back where we came from and a lot of bloodshed and all these things that's happening. So, but also, all groups need to know the power within that group, yeah. the power within that culture, and that if it wasn't for uh, other groups, we don't need to be top heavy in the white or the black or the Hispanic with 33% divided between in this district with our children. And each group need to understand each other's culture and the positivity. So there was something that was said, uh, like with the Hispanic community, that the contributions uh, need to be made known of what they have done to make America great. I noticed in the statue it also, it talked about the history, but it also talked about contributions of African Americans to America, American society. Yes. We need to get top heavy in that. That's where we're losing it right now. And if we get top heavy in that, our children will know that they're being taught what they need to be taught. Thank oh my you, God, Dr. I Mills. went too long. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you, Dr. Mills. Okay. Ms. Richardson? Uh, yes, um, I wanted to just add to to that. I do have a question um, that I'm going to ask, and this is not this is from one of our residents. It was uh, texted to me, and the question was, why not teach Black history year round? It will help lower the crime rate. Example, for example, gangs and gang violence, domestic violence, bullying, teen dropout, etc. This would help bring back unity in the black community like it was before integration. So I, I know you've pretty much answered the uh, year round, but I just want to emphasize, um, as this person said, uh, and it's a young man, he went to school here, here in um, St. Lucie County, graduated, he's about 28 years old. And so he's not that um, far removed from, um, from, from being educated here. Um, so anyway, um, so in his words, um, he says that this, the change that will come about from teaching this history, you know, is so significant, you know, um, and I think that I, I echo what he's saying right here. I agree with him, you know, that 
this can bring about um, significant changes to our community. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to beat this dead horse here, but uh, for me, um, where I'm coming from, it's about teaching our children the history that will empower, motivate, and inspire. Uh, you know, so, and that's why I think it's so important, especially in certain, to everybody, but, you know, in areas that we can't, we don't have the resource that, again, I'm going to go back because everything goes back to money, you know, that we need to, to use something else and, 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 and just be diligent about it, you know, and uh, going back to the accountability part, you know, yes, we do need accountability, not just on paper, because I can make data say anything I wanted to say, reflect anything I wanted to, to reflect. I just need to Google the right area. You know, um, but I, I think that the accountability, in addition to coming from the teachers and coming from, um, uh, you know, the, the principals or whatever, I think that, you know, maybe, you know, we can think about, you know, asking the kids because who better know what they are being taught or what they are learning, what they are um, retaining than our children you know, and maybe have a little survey, start a little survey, you know, so that we'll get it from the kids' point of view, what it is that they are they are or are not learning. You know, when I was campaigning, I was told that, um, you know, they're being taught it, they just don't know, you know? So now if they are being taught it, then they, they need to know that they are being taught. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson. Any other questions or comments, board members? One of the one of the things you didn't mention, or I didn't hear you mention, and in regards to what we're going to do to improve this, is that currently we've had, um, I think, I don't know the number of our high schools that have actually taught, yeah. you know, have a second yeah. curriculum, an elective for, for black history. Um, so I wanted to bring that out. I was just getting ready to say the same thing. That to, to present, I, I thought we had it in there. So, I did too. I just wrote it on my face. That, no, it's not question. a question. It's a, it's a statement just to let yeah, everybody know right. because one of the things that we have done is that as of next school year, it will be at every high school. All six high schools will have the, the African-American uh, elective history class. And at the same time, see, that's two separate things because that's all... African American history, and it will be at each of our schools. That's something that has been an improvement from last year. Um, and so I'm really excited about that, as well as everything else that you said, mainly of what we're going to do to move forward and to improve. Right, that is correct. Dr. Bills, thank you so much for saying it. I did not include that in the presentation. Mm -hmm. We currently have three. We will have all the schools will offer that course next year. That course is fantastic, completely aligned also to the U.S. history course, which has a, an end of course exam. So we're, we're really looking forward to a lot of students signing up to take that elective. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, seeing and hearing no others. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Go ahead and address this. Um, I see Brother Carl in the back, and I, I know this was like 12 years ago, we hired a, a a professor, I can't remember his name, but uh -huh. uh, that was from Stetson University. He came and helped bring the bare bones to this uh, curriculum. Right. What was his name? I can't recall his name, but that is when we what were applying. Dr. Coggin, yes, yes. And he came in and he brought it in. Back then, uh, we used to have um, overheads. And we placed the overhead on there as we talked about it. And, and it is good to see where our curriculum have, has moved and the accountability that we can be able to watch and see how it, it is being used in the classroom. And this gives me hope as a, as a school board member that now principals are able to even monitor it too. Because principals don't really go to all the learning sessions. It's teachers um, collaborating amongst themselves and now they're all gonna have the opportunity to be able to use this and to do it with fidelity. And that's what gives me great hope. Also, as we said, it's something that keeps on continually growing too. So we're never gonna be able to stop. We're just gonna have to come back and reevaluate the situation. And I applaud the school district for doing this and doing such a great job. Um, you know, I'm just very pleased to see how it's going. 
and, and again, you know, some things, you know, we have to tweak. Um, if the community, you know, I've seen schools have after school programs where men of tomorrow have started out of something like this, where they've done, pulled students to the side and said, you know, a church would adopt a school and say, hey, we want to get involved and do something after school and teach, you know, different things. You know, I encourage community members, if, if that's your passion, your vision, we can, we can, we can help, obviously, not this year with COVID and stuff, but in the future, let's put together a program and develop a partnership. So. Well, I want Thank to expand you. on that, too, with the community, because this year with COVID, we weren't able to come in. Bonita Williams, is, I, I believe, still is here. Bonita's there, a longtime teacher, and um, her and, and, and... And volunteer still. Yes, 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 yes. And, and some of the folks she works with, with Chris Taylor uh, and Queen Townsend and others, you know, have gone into the schools. I, it's not where somebody says something and then we never see them again. They're, they're in there. They're over at Central. They're, I, I know they're at CA Moore. I know they're at Forest Ford. Grove. Um, and we want more of that. We, we want more of that. And we need more of that. It's something that just can't be on the shoulders of the school district. And, um, you know, the presentation today, you know, I'm known for a long time in this community and for what I stand for. Our principals, when I talked to our principals, our principals said, yes, this is an area we need to, to take a further look at. Um, so we built in tools to help them to be, um, to be as successful as they can be uh, because um, we wouldn't be where we were right now with the gains that we've made without what they've, with what they, what they've accomplished and what uh, our teachers have been able to accomplish and staff members as well. We talk about the book, Good to Great, and, and you gotta confront brutal facts. So that's what we did. We took a look and said, where are we and where do we need to be? Um, and uh, what you saw here, I'll put that up against anybody, anywhere. And then you, now you say, okay, no, well, let's see it done. Let's see it implemented. And you build on past practices and what's, what's occurred. And we've been able to do that in every challenge that we've been asked to face we've been able to make improvements there. So I'm very excited about this uh, and glad that it's, you know, I'm glad we have members of the community that came in as well so they could hear from us and take out some of the irresponsible comments that were made that were completely false, you know, that we were gonna do away with something which, you know, I, you know, I would leave. I would leave if we were gonna do away with something that, like that because this is so important to our community uh, and for our country as well and that we, you know, we blend and we balance it with everything else that's out there. There's a guy that comes and speaks about everything's put on schools over the last 100 years and you name any social movement where it is and we gladly take it on uh, and take on more and then do the best that we can but the support from the community is, is valuable. We want them in our schools. We want them working with our students and hopefully not, you know, next year we feel like, you know, if everything keeps going in the direction it is. Uh, most of these principals had those programs in their schools as well. So I appreciate the comments from, from the board members and I appreciate the, uh, the community being here. And this is uh, at the forefront and uh, you know, excited about the future. And Ms. Richardson did have one Richardson more did. question or comment. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say also add my thank yous to, um, you know, to everybody that, you know, participated today and, and, I, and I too am excited. Um, as to where we are going, you know, um, we were having this conversation, and I, I really see our community growing and coming together as a whole. So it, it's really good times are ahead. So I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Mills. Yeah, he's all the way in the back. I, everybody knows Charlie Matthews from back in the days and from even now, and. Um, and just wanted to make that acknowledgement. Thank you for coming to the board meeting. Uh, Mr. Gent, there was something you mentioned about having more people from the community going into the schools and being guest speakers. You know, the Speakers Bureau has done that, but it's um, maybe we can look at, you know, I know everything costs money, but maybe we can look at, I know we used to have a volunteer um, employee and I don't think we have that position filled. If we do have that position filled, I think that they should focus on the community coming in as speakers to be speakers to the different schools and the different classrooms. Because we could, this could become a very powerful um, program in which uh, our children will get all types of people from all over the community into their classrooms to speak into their lives people that they get real people, not just book people, but real people in today's time. Um, and uh, so if we had someone that could really focus on that, and I would be more than happy to kind of 
help mentor or tutor them in that area, I just can't be the one to do it. <laughs> so um, I'm asking us to look into that, to have someone that would really focus in that area. Thank you. Absolutely. I think one of Thank the you. most enlightening things that you shared, Dr. Watt, today was that there are 26 different components that were required to touch on. And I was doing the division in my mind, and you know, in nine months of school, that's a lot to get in. Um, but to tag on to that, Dr. Mills, we are a rich, rich community with people of varying talents and skills and stories mm -hmm. to tell. And I think that could be a good way to integrate all 26 of those components, you know, to, to make, uh, build our community, make it stronger, mm -hmm. um, and bring awareness at, at the same time. So thank you for that enlightening point. I, I know and appreciate you principals more than you can ever imagine. I know the load is, is heavy to lift, um, but we are so grateful that you are on our team and helping in that lift and appreciate all you do every single day to ensure that the students get the education that they need. And I know you've um, taken more of your time. I'm surprised Mr. Gent has um, <laughs> given that much away. So if you all need to make a quick exit, I completely understand. <laughs> get back May 1st is National sites. Principals Day, and that's a Saturday. So you got Saturday off. Oh, boy. Okay, on your day. Isn't he generous? <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. I know, and it, I know. I was going to say, you guys, go ahead, and I know you yeah, got to get back. So, take go ahead and get back. but again, thank you for being here, and especially thank you for your insights um, as we go through this process. I appreciate your comments, Dr. Mills, and uh, one of the most important things in our society today are role models. And uh, I'm blowing smoke at you. I'm not. You are a true role model, Dr. Ph.D. Donald Mills. I just want you to know that, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate your comments. Secondly, on page 39, uh, page 39, Dr. Wiles, another woman, Dr. Ph.D. Wiles, on page 39, exemplary school district status, something I was unaware of, one of nine recognized districts in Florida, Commissioner of Education's <clears throat> African American History Task Force, how many, that's nine out of how many districts? 60 something? 67, 67 districts, nine out of 67. Uh, that's up there with the 98.3. I like to mention those things, you know. And uh, the last thing, I, if I could, uh, I know you recognize our principals and Mr. Jen's advisory. Before they leave, could they just stand so we could see them on uh, and maybe just give them a little bit more uh, notoriety? Absolutely. If, if you could ask them this. And I'm taking. Um, she's pretty new at yeah, what you're doing, the turning the school around. But all of the rest of them all had the speakers bureaus coming to their schools and had many of us come through and encourage the children. And I'm sure you know how much you could hear a pen drop at your schools. You could hear a pen drop when we had people speak into the lives of those students and share their life story. And all of you can attest to that and thank you for your work because you are definitely jewels and we appreciate you. And Ms. Harrington, I'm calling you. <laughs> okay. Go and have a fabulous rest of your day. Um, I think we have one more comment for Ms. Richardson and then we will wrap it up. Ms. Richardson? Oh, I just wanted, thank you. I just wanted to say um, congratulations to Mr. Vaughn <laughs> um, I know that this is probably going to be his last workshop. He is retiring. So I just wanted to say thank you for your service to the school district. Congratulations on your retirement. And you are going to be missed. I've only known you for a brief time. But um, the word I would use um, in reference to you, Mr. Vaughn, would be a gentleman. I think you're a gentleman in every sense of the word. So I just wanted to say congratulations. And thank you. And also, I'd like to thank our, our custodian. When we were doing the presentation, you know, we couldn't have survived all of this, you know, being safe and healthy without, you know, everything that you did for our school or have been doing for our schools. So I did. I just wanted to say thank you to our custodial team as well. Thank you so very much. Okay. 
We have no other business to come before us today. We have received a lot of information. Um, I encourage you to take your packets and keep reviewing, um, especially with these funds that are coming down for over the next couple of years. We, we have a lot of work to do, um, but I'm proud to serve on this team and to see us accomplish it together. Go have a great day.